What's up, guys? <clears throat> so I'm testing something here. Let's see if I can share my screen. How does one share a screen? Evening, Charles. Pop up chat, push through that. Hey guys, just trying to uh, figure some things out because this is new to me. So give me, bear with me here. What's up, Craig? Hey, thanks, Andrew. I appreciate that. Is there a way to share my screen? Struggling here. Oh. Hey, Renzo. Glad everybody's here. Glad people are showing up. That's cool. Hey, so right now I'm um, posting a little message to the uh, the Patreon group that's just telling people that this is happening. A little live chat thing. Yeah, Cam, you do need to get one of my boards, man. They're fun to work with. Uh, let me just post real quick to my Patreon here and tell people that this is happening. Let's see. It's a video. And... There's the link. Come hang out and ask questions. All right, posted it to, to Patreon people too. So Patreon people <clears throat> can see that this is happening. So that's fun. I really wish I could share my screen though. Hey, Dom. No, you're the bomb. But yeah, I'm trying to make FPGA fun. Also trying to share my screen. I'm going to stop talking about it because it's probably annoying you guys. I think I've looked everywhere. I don't think YouTube lets me do it. Something to improve on for next time, maybe. This is a test. So, you know, you guys can feel honored that you're the first people participating in the YouTube live stream thing uh, for me. You know, being on this side of the camera instead, usually I'm on that side watching people stream themselves. So that's fun. But, uh, you know, there's a little bit of a learning curve associated with that. So I apologize in advance. Use OBS. I was looking at that. Okay, OBS. That's probably like a whole thing. How to stream YouTube OBS. Yeah, okay. Oh, there's a lot of steps. There's three, three paragraphs. Yeah, yeah. Okay. 
Okay. OBS. OBS will next time. I'm definitely going to be doing OBS so that I can share my screen. That's more fun than just this. But uh, hey, so th this is new. We were at six minutes into this. Okay. That's three people recommending OBS. It's going to happen next time, guys. Don't worry. So this is new. It's a test. Welcome. Um, I am... Uh, here to like talk to you guys about anything FPGA that's on your minds, any like questions that you have, anything you wanted to talk about. I guess it doesn't really have to be about FPGA stuff, you know, anything really in general, but uh, I'm happy to answer questions. Uh, I was planning on sharing a screen and maybe doing some like code walkthrough stuff too, but that'll be for next time, something to look forward to. All right. I'm very interested in FPGA stuff. What direction would you recommend from Chen Chen, fourth year undergrad student doing a master's, looking at doing a master's? Um, yeah, I, uh, in terms of whether or not, I mean, are you asking whether or not you should do a master's or like which part of FPGA stuff you should focus on? Let me know what you think. Um, <clears throat> hey, what type of Intel integrating, where's the super chat feature? You know what? You guys are more advanced than I am with some of this stuff. I don't know where the super chat feature is. You tell me, oh, okay. is there a button? Okay. What type of Intel, uh, what do you think Intel integrating FPGA is in their processors? Yeah, that's super cool. I'm, I'm excited about um, just Intel acquiring Altera in the first place. I mean, Altera was kind of like, I mean, FPGAs are super niche, right? But like Intel buying them brings them to the forefront and makes them a part of a big, a huge company. Intel has you know, big, big reach. So I'm really curious to see, you know, what they're able to do and uh, whether or not they're able to make them just more accessible in general. So I think that's, it's pretty neat. Um, if anyone's gonna make FPGAs more accessible, it's gonna be a big company like Intel. <clears throat> so Chen Chen, what were you talking about when you were talking about uh, getting doing FPGA stuff. What direction should I learn in more master's programs, which can relate to FPGA? Um, that's a good question. Um, I think that, uh, the, well, I can tell you what I would do. Uh, what I would love to do personally is I would love to see what type of, you know, AI machine learning applications are possible using FPGAs. Uh, as hardware accelerators. So um, whether or not that's practical, I think is, is probably the first question that should be answered um, because GPUs are super powerful and really good at like multiplying numbers, which is basically what a lot of um, genetic algorithms and machine learning is, is just like super fast multiply and accumulate operations. So, um, you know, first question is, are FPGAs a good candidate for that? And if so, how can they accelerate um, some of the some of that hardware processing. This gets back to the Intel acquisition thing. Like I think that um, Xilinx in particular has played up a lot of their the AI and the neural nets and the machine learning stuff to because uh, that's like super hot and exciting and cool. And there's potentially a lot of problems that that technology can solve. So um, that's that's what I'm most interested in at this point. If I had all the time in the world, I would definitely just do. I'd start with TensorFlow and just get more of a you know, background in the machine learning things and uh, eventually just figure out if FPGAs are well suited for that application or not. Uh, that's that's cool in my opinion. Best test textbook for DSP on FPGA. I don't have a great answer for that. I, uh, I kind of created Nanland because I didn't really like any textbooks to be honest with you. I uh, never really learned well from them. Um, I always like to be like kind of hands-on and see specific examples and uh, you know really dive into the details. Um, and, and do it myself and not just like read about it. Um, so I, that my, my, the reason why Namlin exists is because I don't like textbooks basically. What vendor would you use for your own custom boards? Is Lattice really that much more approachable? Um, I, I have used Lattice in the real world actually. I used an ECP five in, uh, an, F, in an FPGA design and uh, it worked really well. I mean, there was a few, it was when the ECP, the ECP5 was really new. So I actually had to like work with the field reps from Lattice to like work out some bugs and stuff. And that was interesting. Um, but in general, uh, you know, survey the marketplace, make a trade study and like come up with your requirements. So what, you know, how many pins do you need? What, 
what's the cost need to be, what temperature requirements do you have, all that stuff. Resources, how many resources do you need? Uh, you know, LUTs and all block RAMs and all sorts of things like that. And, um, you know, pick, pick a part based on that. Um, so the ECP5 was was well suited for our applications. Actually, we need, we need something super small. The ECP5 was a 10 by 10 package, 10 millimeters by 10 millimeters. And that was the only one that uh, that was that size that had an LPDDR interface. So that's why we chose that part. Um, so any one requirement could drive you into using a totally different family of FPGAs. That's another reason why like VHDL and Verilog are cool is because you can just, um, you know, write your code for RTL code, VHDL, Verilog, and you can target it to Altera or Intel, you can target it to Xilinx, whatever. Hello, guys. Hey, what do you think about high-level synthesis? Oh, great question. Yeah, HLS stuff. Um, high-level synthesis, for those of you who don't know, I haven't really talked about it a ton, um, but it's it's like writing C code instead of VHDL or Verilog and having the C code generate um, RTL. Um, so... I've done a little bit of that myself, and I think it's really neat. I think that there are well-defined applications where it makes sense, and I think I, I do want to do some more videos on HLS in the future, so absolutely. Have you ever done multi-axis stepper motor control with FPGAs? Uh, I haven't done stepper motor control multi-axis, no, just a single stepper motor. Uh, hey, Craig, <laughs> it's Craig. Um, what's up, Craig? Um, I haven't done stepper motor control. I haven't done multi-axis stepper motor control, but I think it would just be like the same thing in a different axis. Uh, do, do, what's the reason behind FPGA boards getting a huge price jump when they include a PCI Express connector? Is it a, a weird licensing cost? Um, I'm guessing because as soon as you have PCI Express, you have to have CERTES, which, hey, spoiler alert, CERTES tutorial coming soon. Um, and as soon as you have a CERTES high-speed transceiver to drive the PCI Express interface, it just, uh, you're in a different category of FPGAs at that point, so they can charge a premium for that for that technology. Have you tried AWS FPGA? Um, you know, I haven't actually. I, I haven't had the need for it, and I've just been able to like do all the synthesis stuff locally. So, um, you know, for me, it hasn't really been something I've looked into for like doing. You're talking about. I assume you're talking about for AWS the the building, the place and route, um, the whole build synthesis pro uh, pro project process. Uh, no, I haven't actually done that with on a cloud-based solution. I, th I think if I had like a really big FPGA design, I, that'd be something worth looking into. But um, for now, you know, the longest build process I've had was a Zinc, and that was like a 45-minute build, and that was doable. The key is don't build often. Uh, make sure you solve all your problems in simulation so you never have to build, or you build like once or twice a day. Uh, with those big builds, it's like, it's, yeah. Debugging on hardware is becomes impossible when you have a big FPGA. So don't, you try to do it as little as possible. Ryan, I'm learning the fundamentals behind making overlays with the pink framework. What do you think about this route as an introduction to FPGAs? I looked at pink a while back and I'd have to refresh my memory, uh, which I could do by, you know, using Google. What is, Oh yeah, Python. Yeah, okay, it's Python-based FPGAs. I don't know enough about it to to like you know speak to it really. Um, I like Python and I like FPGAs. So I don't know if you tie the two of them together. That's cool. I mean, it's interesting to me because you know Python's an interpreted language, so you don't have a compiler, so it compiles as it runs. But FPGAs synthesize. I don't know how that works. I assume you have the, the, like you need to compile the code before running it um, with pink code. But I haven't done it personally. It's cool though. I like textbooks for a quick reference. Sometimes textbooks are nice. I'm not saying I'm not hating on textbooks. I'm just saying for me personally, they didn't they didn't captivate my attention as much as like this sweet YouTube live stream. I'm learning the fundamental. Oh, I already read that one. Our American companies work with VHDL or Verilog. Okay, so defense companies generally VHDL. Um, and I would say like any California Silicon Valley type company, probably Verilog. Uh, so where do you want to work? What industry do you want to work in? Uh, would you recommend NAND to Tetris? I don't know what that is. So I don't know if I can recommend it. I like Tetris. Supposing your country, there aren't many uh, jobs about FPGAs, do you recommend to go abroad or just change your mindset and learn other things like micros? Um, hmm. 
I don't know. Traveling abroad is fine. That's more of a question about what, what do you want to do? Do you want to travel abroad? Look for other opportunities in other countries? That sounds interesting. Um, that's, yeah, that's up to you. I mean, I, I've been doing more microcontroller design actually over the last few years, and I like those too. I think the confluence of both is interesting to you know figure out wh which applications are good for FPGAs, which applications are good for micros, so you can be just be a better, well, more well-rounded person in general. So, schematic or code? Code. Are you talking about like schematic, schematically designing an FPGA? Yeah, no. There's a cat on the table. Do you have any ideas about blue spec Verilog? Um, I don't know what that is. Oh, everyone want to say hi to the cat? Oh, there's Kitty. She often interrupts all my videos. Yeah. Okay. Tonight's no no different. Uh, blue spec. I'm gonna look that up now. Blue spec Verilog. Is this like a different language? Risk five open source cores. Okay, is this cores maybe? What is this? I'm trying to figure out what this is as I'm reading. Learning blue spec. Um, is there like an about blue spec? Blue spec. Okay, I, you know what? This is taking me too long to figure out what blue spec even is. What's good about blue spec system Verilog? I've been doing more system Verilog stuff recently and uh, I'm, I'm definitely a fan of system Verilog. System Verilog takes things to the next level. I actually write all my uh, test code, like, like real test code is now system Verilog test code because it's just that much better. Okay, I'm gonna just not answer that blue spec question because I wasn't able to find an answer quick enough. And I don't, feel, I don't know what it is. Is there any way to change the architecture design dynamically? Yeah, there's partial reconfiguration. Um, you need to like lock down parts of your design and say that you know a certain part might change. You can boot different images. Um, or you can use a processor. That's kind of like changing the design on the fly. Arctic 7 has a 6G 30s for like 40 bucks. That doesn't sound that expensive. Yeah, partial reconfiguration. Yeah, that guy's talking about it too. My HDL transpose. Uh, do, do, do. Okay, somebody else knows what NAND to Tetris is, so that's cool. <clears throat> Craig asks, do you plan on CPU inclusion? Yeah, I do, actually. Um, I really would love the time. People have asked me so many times about like whether and like what applications are good for CPUs, what applications are good for FPGAs, and I could definitely tackle that, but I wanted to go into more detail about CPUs and, and talk about pros and cons and start doing more details about that too. You should definitely watch the Nanda Tetris TED Talk. You built a four-bit CPU virtual design a computer and write software for it. It's simple enough. They do it in high schools. Oh, that sounds cool. Neat. Will HLS, high-level synthesis, have a future in FPGA industry? Are any companies apart from Xilinx working on this? Um, yeah, I, I think so. Um, I think HLS, like I said, is useful for certain applications. Um, I think that uh, HLS is great if you have like some some simple C code that would be a pain to you know transcribe to VHDL or Verilog. Uh, maybe like uh, especially for like mathematical things like filters and and um, things like that that maybe are easy to write in C but difficult to to transcribe. Um, there's some I don't think you could do like an entire FPGA design with HLS, but I think you could definitely have some segments that make sense for HLS. So you have a, a wrapper around an HLS module and inside you have some C code or something like that that you can, you can compile into, into RTL. Why not le learn uh, web audio API? Why not? Any simple open source projects to get started with? Quartus plus DEO zero. You can get started with the Nanland Go board where all the code is posted for free. That'd be cool. Um, yeah, check out the Go board. Um, here's a link. Wait for it. Yeah. 
Yeah, go board. Um, yeah, check out the go board, guys. I mean, that's the, the reason why I created it in the first place was because I was super frustrated with the state of, you know, people would sell hardware is a dime a dozen. And you honestly, you can get cheaper boards than the go board if you want. If cheap is your goal, you can you can beat the go board on price. But um, what I wanted to do was put out a board that actually had some tutorials behind it that you could actually like follow along with and slowly learn things. Um, you buy the hardware and you get the you get the code uh, you get the code for free and you get the tutorials for free. So that was the purpose of the go board. Um, and I, I don't know, I've sold a lot of them and people seem to be happy with them. So I think it was a success. And you guys are probably listening to me talk, so that's great too. Um, boo, boo, boo. Let's see. I prefer system Verilog and it combines good size of both Verilog and VHDL. Plus, adds a ton of stuff on top of that. Yeah, I I agree with that. I like system Verilog the more I use it. What changes to the FPGA technology do you see coming in the future? Um, I see more. It's a good question. Um, I see two two things happening. Like one is a, a intense miniaturization. Like like Lattice is coming out with some really small FPGAs that are literally literally like, you know that big, like they're, you know, two millimeters by two millimeters. They're super tiny. Um, they're really good for like, inside of a cell phone, if you just want to do some super custom thing, um, you know, you can buy a cheap, small FPGA and make it reconfigurable and do some custom FPGA design that's pretty small. So like on the low end, they're useful. Uh, and on the high end, you know, you have these like really powerful FPGAs that can just do like insane amounts of data throughput and mathematical operations. Um, so like this, the data throughput is pretty, pretty crazy. Uh, so like I'm interested to see, um, you know, with maybe like some real like ray tracing tech uh, applications or um, like I said earlier, artificial intelligence. I'm interested to see like what, what happens there. Um, am I going to build a bigger board? I have no plans right now to build more hardware. It's a phenomenal amount of time to build hardware. And if I do it, I want to provide uh, a lot of you know, good support for it. So no, no plans right now. Uh, maybe if I get some more Patreon supporters and I can kick that Patreon uh, donations up a little bit, I'll be able to spend more time doing this stuff and less time at my day job. So, you know, motivation. I don't know. You guys. Hey, you know what? Shameless plug. Let's do it. Uh, check out my Patreon, guys, if you haven't already. Uh, Patreon.com forward slash Nanland, and I'll put a link in the chat. Uh yeah, really, the, the Patreon's been huge, and I probably should have said that already. If you're here from Patreon, uh, thank you so much. Um, the Patreon has been more successful than I than I thought it would be, uh, more successful than I even hoped it would be. So uh, I really appreciate all the help I've gotten there. It, it actually is really motivating to, for me to have um, you know people backing me financially because it basically I, I feel the pressure. I gotta I gotta provide good good content for you guys. So this year actually I've put out more videos than any other year already. The year is not over, and we're doing cool stuff like this. I wouldn't be doing this without the Patreon. So if you're not yet a Patreon subscriber, uh, please please do check it out. This is free. This live stream thing is free tonight. It is a test, so I'm curious to see how many people show up. We got 39 people already. That's actually more than I thought would join. Um, and if, if it goes well, you know, I'll continue to do this. Um, but, you know, having the Patreon people supporting me financially makes it more viable to do these things more often. So some motivation. Um, let's see. Would I ever, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm back. I'm getting backed up. Why not make a video? I don't know what that is. Are you going to do anything with NOC? I don't know what that abbreviation stands for off the top of my head. JavaScript? JavaScript. Would you ever consider a meet and greet somewhere? Eh, probably not. I prefer the virtual things. Uh, I remember you promised a video about pure pros and cons of system on a chip like Zinc versus pure FPGA. Uh, yeah, that's a good one. I I literally have a to-do list that's like, it's a text file, it's huge, it's out of control. Uh, planning to put together a system Verilog tutorial. Yes, I do want to talk more about system Verilog. Like I said, I, I, I've been using more system Verilog and I really like it. I really like it for test benches. Um, I think that even my VHDL designs, I'm testing in system Verilog, so that should tell you something about it. Uh, have you worked on a Xilinx Kintec 7? I worked on an Arctic 7. There you go. Uh, what sites do you hit to stay current with FPGA industry? Um, I generally just browse like Slashdot and nerd, nerd news websites and Ars Technica and things like that. Um, I don't specifically seek out FPGA things. Maybe I should more often. Um, yeah. How much does custom IP end up costing for Xilinx, Altera, and Lattice? 
which is cheaper. Um, th yeah, there is more and more good IP being put out by those companies um, that like a lot of the things that you want to do are probably already done. And um, I'll, they give away a lot of it for free. I, let's see. The last thing I had to pay for was a DDR3 memory controller from Lattice, and that was like $3,000. Mm, my problem with small FPGAs is that they require cutting edge PCB tech. Yeah, the, the small pitch thing, the small pitch is definitely a problem. Although I thought most FPGA houses could do 0.5 millimeters at this point. One mil, anything less than one millimeter when I first started out, like over 10 years ago, was definitely a challenge. Um, but I thought 0.5 millimeters wasn't too, too bad. Excuse me for a second. I've been telling people, hey, what's up, Fox? Fox, if you're uh, the same Fox from Patreon, thank you for your support. Um, I've been telling people for years that I think FPGAs are going to be putting computers as general purpose device. Now Apple is doing so on some of their higher end workstations for video. Yeah, video, definitely. I know a lot of the um, you know, industrial uh, video editing software um, uses some pretty high end FPGAs for to, to just like, scrub through and render all their videos really, really fast. So that's a cool application. Totally agree with high density FPGAs. PCB becomes an expensive component. Yeah, yeah, it does. Um, upcoming videos on DSP blocks. I did one on a DSP, right? Didn't I? Did I do that? YouTube, DSP, and land. Sometimes I just Google myself because I forget if I did something. Mm. I thought I did. If I didn't, I definitely should. So uh, the answer to that question is yes, if I didn't already. Oh, network on chip. Now I need to go back and figure out what the original question was. Do, 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 do. Are you going to do anything with network on chip? Uh, thank you, everybody, who defined that acronym for me. Um, <clears throat> I don't have any plans to do anything with network on chip at this time. Do you think you would ever delve into more complicated things like timing, closure, floor planning, et cetera? Uh, I definitely want to go into more details about timing errors and how to fix them. Uh, floor planning, I haven't done a ton of floor planning to be honest with you. Um, like, are you talking about like, if you have really high speed floor planning or just like general pin planning? Um, so pin planning, yeah, that's pretty common. And maybe I should do something about just like how do you pick pins? Um, but um, floor planning, like in general, like where you want to put dedicated things, I haven't, I never had like timing issues that were that severe that I had to like lock down an area of the FPGA and, and had to really deal with it. Uh, but timing closure, yeah, I, should, I, should, I definitely want to talk about that more. I did a little bit about that recently when I talked about uh, setup and hold time, propagation delay and timing errors. and um, I definitely want to go into that more at a more detail, like how to fix timing errors. Cause I didn't really spend a ton of time thinking about that. Future of the industry. I've talked a little bit about that already. Uh, Xilinx provides good IPs for free. Yeah, they do. Um, memory controllers and things like that. Yeah, definitely. I agree with that. Do you have any suggestions for beginners, especially coding style? Uh, I did put together a page on coding style. I mean, my coding style changes all the time. I, I, I put together here some recommendations. Let's see, do I still agree with these recommendations? Sometimes I put this together at least five years ago, um, four years ago. I, I do feel super strongly about like I underscore and O underscore to define whether or not it's an input or an output. So those are the most important things. Um, defining whether or not something's a register or a wire is also useful. Um, and then they become less useful from like after that. But, um, you know, FPGA code, you know, about a little bit about style. FPGA code has a crap load of acronyms built into it. There's like, you know, DV for data valid and like RD for read and WR for write and TX for transmit and RD, RX for receiver. And, and then there's a million different acronyms for like I2C, SPI, uh, CERDES. You know, ARM, HF, high-speed bus, whatever, a million different acronyms. And um, 
you know, I find if you use like camel case, which is like capitalizing the first letter of every word, like in C, that's pretty common, or Pascal case and those types of coding lines, it's really hard to tell what acronyms, like where the acronym begins and where the word ends because yeah, it's just difficult. Um, so I use underscores to separate all my acronyms and words and I capitalize all my acronyms. And I, I don't do that in C, I don't do that in, in Python. I only do it in FPGAs because there's just so many damn acronyms everywhere. So I feel like that's, uh, for me, I, it's, it's useful. Everybody's different with coding style though. I'm gonna give them a whole war about that. Uh, any companies that combine FPGA with AI, their names, please. You have to like go to Xilinx's website and look at Xilinx does some AI stuff, and they're catering to they're catering their chips to AI companies. I, I don't, off the top of my head, know any companies that are specifically doing that. I can order uh, ten six layer PCB with tolerance is good enough for blah 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 in less than uh, 0.5 requires micro vias, which are $600 an hour. Oh, okay. Well, maybe it is a lot. I worked in the defense industry, which is just like, boom, balling out. No big deal. Um, so, yeah, money was never like a requirement for me, really. I did look at the Mr. thing a little bit, and um, it's super cool stuff. Yeah, I, I like the Mr. thing. Uh, what about videos describing bus architecture? Uh, I do. Oh, I do want to do one. Um, I have a... Yeah, I have an FPGA bus video that I've been meaning to do as well. PLLs, PLLs are great. Yeah, Fox, I, I agree with PLLs. I should definitely do one on, on PLLs. You know what, I should hold. Because I do have a list, like I said, I don't know if PLLs specifically is on my list, but that'd be an easy one. Because PLLs are, they seem like this really complicated concept. It's like, oh, phase lock loop. I got to understand how that works. But when it comes down to it, it's just a clock thingy. No big deal. Uh, where's my to-do list? Here it is. Uh, PLL is going on the list. There you go. Okay, it's on. Uh, do, 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 do. What about videos on built-in microprocessor? Yeah. Um, yeah, that, that bridges the gap. I do want to talk about microcontrollers and FPGAs and how they're different and how a microcontroller is useful and how an FPGA is useful. And then a built-in microcontroller is like taking that knowledge and putting it all together. So yeah, definitely want to talk about that. Videos on lesser known model sim features. Like which ones, for example? I prefer Verilog, System Verilog, but I've started writing most of my logic with all capitals. All right. Currently using a Terrasic DEO board with Cordis Prime and Model Sim. Any other recommendations, simulation environments, or design software? Um, yeah, Model Sim comes built into Cordis now. So if you're using a Cordis board, Model Sim seems like a pretty good choice. It's what I'm currently using as well. Hi, Kat. Um, yeah, that seems like an easy one. Have you looked at Verilator? You know, I was just looking at Verilator. That's funny you ask that question. Uh, but it's not, so it's not a, uh, it's not a simulation tool. Like I didn't, I thought it was a simulation tool at first, but it's not, it's a verification tool. So you need, so the, that is very different. And, um, I haven't talked a lot about verification, but, um, you know, it's more like you write how your design should behave. And if it doesn't behave that way, then it flags an error. Uh, versus simulation where you actually look at the waveforms on your screen and you can see how the design is behaving and you need to think like, oh, what if I inject this thing? Does it behave correctly? Does, does the waveform generate the right thing? Uh, versus verification, which is let me let, let, let me let the tools just like jam it with random uh, inputs and outputs and, and make sure that none of my um, criteria, my constraints on my design have been violated. It's a totally different way to think about it, um, but Verilator is more suited for the verification side of things. Verilator is great. There you go. Electron Ash agrees. Verilator is great. Uh, what three pieces of advice would you give to a digital design co-op? That's like an interview question for me. Um, link to a GitHub, have some designs that are cool that you can demo and bleh, learn Emacs or VI. What do you think about that? Icarus Verilog. I haven't used it, um, so I can't speak to Icarus. 
Seems cool. I like the idea of open source. The only reason I don't use it for NAND land stuff actually is just because I need to do a lot of designs in VHDL and Verilog, so I need a cross-language synthesis uh, simulation tool. PLLs can be very easy or extremely hard depending on what they are used for. I haven't had too much trouble with them as Mi 06, but um, I, yeah, I guess they could get challenging. What do you think of MicroSemi? I'm not the, yeah, actually, you know what? I'm not the biggest fan of MicroSemi. Their tools are kind of shit. Prove me wrong, MicroSemi. Prove me wrong. They're all, you know, okay. They're also the, they're also Flash-based FPGAs. Uh, so they used to be Actel. They got bought by MicroSemi. Um, Actel is a sea of gates, so it doesn't have the traditional like LUTs and flip flops and um, uh, yeah, that that like um, the SRAM based FPGA fabric that Lattice mostly uses. Although Lattice does have some flash based FPGAs and Xilinx and Altera, although Altera does have some flash flash based FPGAs, but Microsemi is like all in with the flash thing. That's their that's their stick. Um, they also produce a lot of FPG. So flash based FPGAs are like instant turn on. They're they're fast to boot. Um, you don't need an external SRAM part to store your FPGA designs. So that's cool. Um, but Microsemi's tools are shit and uh, it just drives me crazy. So bad. They're also really useful for space applications, which I currently am working in the space industry. So like Microsemi is pretty attractive for that reason. But their tools though, God, fix the tools guys. Verilator can be used for simulation though too. Okay, I mean, I haven't spent a ton, ton of time with it. Any uh, killer ideas for an EE capstone project? Uh, I don't know. No, not off the top of my head. I'm trying to go through comments. So YouTube tutorial la, 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 on some, I don't know what that is. Uh, na, na, na. What about teach, touching on TMRA? Touch my resonance. I don't know what that stands for. TMR? Only having a BS barrier for moving up or going for design. Bachelor of Science? No, that's that's good. That gets you in the door. I, anything to get you in the door, pretty much. You know, I talked about this in a, another video about like, what do you need to get an interview at an FPJ company? And you either have, you know, Bachelor of Science with a good GPA, which should get you in the door if you have some cool, do some projects, do some projects, and put those projects on your resume and show that you have some interest outside of um, just the normal, the normal nine to five. Like you're not in it just for the paycheck. You, it's unfortunate that like for software engineers, that's kind of where the where the bar is, but you, you kind of need to like stand a cut above and the way to do it is to have like a kick-ass GitHub page or um, you know, show that on your resume that you've done some projects, have something cool to demo. Demos are great. Doo -doo -doo. What about web audio API visualization with maglog2, mathlog2 frequency scale? Uh, I, I'm not intimately familiar with that. Is is it really important to take consideration PCB traces impedance when working with buses? Uh, yes, if it's a high speed signal, PCB trace impedance, controlled impedance traces are important if you're going above, I don't know, 50 megahertz probably, you should start worrying about it. And it becomes way more important if you're going above 500 megahertz. So yeah, controlled impedance is definitely. Uh, the dip whip funk will do the job. There you go, dip whip funk. Is PIF5JUS.org powered by MediaWiki? Great question. LabVIEW peeps are also doing FPGA stuff. Ooh, LabVIEW. LabVIEW, my nemesis. You know, LabVIEW tries to do everything. LabVIEW is like the Swiss Army knife of code. They're like, we got it. We got this thing. And it's like not exactly the tool you want to use, but like they, yeah, they do have it. Yes, there is technically there's a knife on, you know, and there's a screw, there's a bottle opener, and there's scissors, but like, mm, Agree 100% of microsemi tools. Yeah, Libero SOC, piece of shit. Will you save the live? Will I save the live? I don't even know how to do it. Do you want me to? Uh, I've been mildly tempered to turn to the dark side and try using Vivado again. Yeah, Vivado's not bad. I, I, see, I see is a piece of shit. I've had better luck with Vivado and Quartus. Like, they're finally getting their shit together in terms of coding. Also, live stream, I get to swear. So, and I'm having a drink. Cheers. I can't wait to see Surdy's video. Hey, man. I can't wait to make it. Oh, triple mode redundancy. Yeah. Oh, t that's what you're talking about. Sorry. Yes, absolutely. What's up, KD Johnson 321? I work, used to work with a Kevin Johnson. Are you that guy? Are you Kevin Johnson? 
Uh, TMR is triple mode redundancy. We use it on space applications to help protect against single event upsets due to radiation. Yeah, totally. Voting logic. So TMR, for those of you who don't know, this is fun. You do the same thing three times. So like, let's say you want to, um, you know, check, you want to just have three flip-flops that have the same output. And those go into um, a comparator circuit that basically checks that uh, two out of the three need to agree on an output in order for it to propagate to the next stage, stage of logic. So if you have, um, so it just increases your resiliency in space applications because of single event upsets, which is basically like a high energy proton that hits your FPGA can turn a zero to a one or a one to a zero. Fun fact, um, the, the Toyota, um, you guys remember when Toyota like had that acceleration problem where Toyotas were just like uh, start accelerating when people said they weren't putting on the gas. Um, one of the possible solutions, and you can check this for yourself, but like I read it online, so it might, might be true. One of the possible explanations for why that was happening was because of protons, like single event upsets and, and bit, bit flips inside of Toyota's control software for their engine control unit literally turning a zero to a one inside of their, their, their control software. So like, yeah, that's a thing. Uh, high, high reliability software is uh, important and difficult. I, I would not necessarily want to be um, writing uh, engine control unit code. There's a lot of things that go into that. People's lives are on, on the line. Okay, I got I to catch up here. One thing that trips us up a lot with Mr. Cores is when you, oh, yeah, uh, do, 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 deep schematic making. Um, hmm. I don't think I'm going to do a ton of stuff with schematics just because that's more of like an EE thing. And there's people who do that all day. I mean, I could, I guess. Um, I wondered if the Xilinx chips annual manual timing a bit better. Uh, yeah, lab is a dirty word. <laughs> hey, thanks, Craig. I'm glad the live stream's going well for you. <laughs> this is fun. Live streams from JavaScript. I'm definitely not going to do that, Andre, because I don't know how to write JavaScript. Um, ISE more cryptic with its error messages than Quartus, and Quartus is quite cryptic. <laughs> it's probably true. Uh, I'm not so much of a coder in that sense, not formally trained. Okay. Bro, that Fallout 4 game speed tied to frame rate is a glitch on Creation Engine. Yeah. Were we talking about Fallout 4? Because I missed that thread. Um, I've been getting better at C and C++ recently and got very later to work with Im I am GUI library. That's neat. Question, is it possible to give a brief explanation on how, I'm getting caught up, this is great, uh, on how, for example, a sequential process works at the gates level? I can't grasp the idea of how sequential execution, sequential execution works at the gate level. I can try to answer that question. Um, there are the, well, I mean, it all comes down to a flip-flop. I and mean, flip-flop is like your, your key component for sequential, you know, keeping state inside your FPGA. Um, so I recommend, I've, I've talked a lot about this. Um, and uh, I would recommend like rewatching my tutorial on like what is a flip-flop inside of an FPGA? And I'll post it here um, because that's that's the critical component. So if you understand how flip-flop works, uh, it, it starts to make sense, but you, that's, that's the, the basic building block of FPGAs. If you didn't have flip-flops, they would just be big, math and Boolean algebra circuits. And you could build latches and stuff, but latches are dirty, dirty, evil. Uh, so don't build latches. Um, but yeah, flip-flops really make FPGAs. They're the workhorse of the FPGA. How do you think the increased usage of FPGAs in the automotive market will shift innovation focus? My God, that's, an, that's like another interview question. If I was interviewing for a job at Ford, um, yeah, I don't have a great answer for that off the top of my head. I do think cars are undergoing, like auto automotive, the automotive market in general is undergoing 
a foundational transformation right now. I don't know if you guys have been paying attention, but uh, electric vehicles are increased. Like, I know it seems like exp electric vehicles are like this niche thing right now. It's like, oh, it's so cute, you have an electric vehicle. Blah, blah, blah. But uh, they're growing like exponentially. And uh, yeah, five years from now, you won't want to buy a gas car anymore. So that's going to be interesting to see how that changes things. Bethesda's game engine sucks balls. Okay. I can't speak to why Bethesda's game engine sucks balls, but uh, Andre says so. So I guess we'll take it for granted. Is Bethesda able to make a game with reasonable or lower amount of glitches slash exploits? What? I don't know. Are they? Yes, they are. What are the common bad habits that new digital design engineers typically have? That's a good question. What are some bad habits? Um, I would say not knowing how to modularize code and to really encapsulate code. Um, I tend to think of things now, I'm able to think of things that like, uh, like what, what is the interface to this to this piece of code look like? Like what are what are my inputs? What are my outputs? And then I write that that piece of that that small piece of logic. And then I think of okay, what's going to interface to that thing? Um, and what are those inputs and what are those outputs? And what wires connect the two things together? Um, and I I can break the problem down very nicely into cores, basically small cores that have a well-defined input output. And I don't think beginners do that very well, um, which is understandable. Like you, sh it's hard to get that mindset of like knowing how things are going to work and how they're going to connect. Um, so that's a skill, um, comes with experience, but yeah, I, I, would, I would say architecture design decisions are difficult for beginners. Uh, what are the, okay, I'm, I'm talking about, done talking about Bethesda, Andre, you're hitting the Bethesda thing pretty hard. Advantages of FPGAs over ASICs, uh, speed, pink, oh, over ASICs? Uh, okay, over ASICs, they're inexpensive in low quantities and they're faster to test different designs on. Question, do you think FPGAs can have a great future in the newbie ecosystem? Like for example, Arduino? That is a great question. Um, I, I have seen a lot of FPGA boards that are like the Arduino of FPGAs and nothing has exploded like the way Arduinos or Raspberry Pis have. So I do think it's possible the price point needs to be right, and you need to have some compelling reason to pick it up. Um, I do think that VHDL and Verilog are, are difficult to learn, and the tools are a little bit cumbersome. So like a web-based thing that was like convenient for people to just program their tools, uh, program their FPGAs with would be cool. I've seen some attempts at that, but nothing that, you know, nothing really has caught on. Andre. <laughs> Yeah, Charles, I agree with uh, with your comment. There will always be petrol heads who love cars with combustion engines, which is fine, but it's funny when some assume that electric cars can't possibly compete in terms of acceler acceleration and top speed. Yeah, I just think that um, when people think electric cars can't compete, it's just because they, they just don't, they just haven't driven one or, um, you know, just surveyed the market. Uh, but yeah, electric cars are pretty sweet nowadays if you haven't been paying attention. What what can ASICs have much higher clock speed compared? Why can they? Uh, ASICs can have a much higher clock speed compared to FPGAs because with an ASIC, you are in control of how far apart things are. Every single uh, input and output to individual components is, is tightly controlled. You have tight, con so you don't need to worry about like all these extra, like, like most of the FPGA design um, when it comes down to it, is all like routing resources. So it's literally like just like the whole thing is just wires. It just allows you to connect anything to anything else. So um, a ton of that, a ton of your design in an FPGA is just the ability to just wire stuff up. And if you have an ASIC, you just you know exactly where that where it's going. You know where the input is. You know where the output is. An ASIC, by the way, is a custom custom circuit that you can make. Costs a few hundred thousand dollars, but you know what? If you're producing a few million of the of a certain chip, totally worth it. Um, so huge NRE, non-recurring engineering, um, but it's worth it if you're producing a lot of them versus buying a lot of FPGAs. So there's a trade-off there. Um, I hope I answered the question. 
Uh, as far as I know, it has to do with the fact that FPGAs use specific building blocks. Do, do, do. Wrapping my head around timing constraints was by far the hardest thing I ever had to do for FPGA design, DDRIO. Yeah, timing constraints are weird. It took me a long time to understand looking at a simulation and um, like like figuring out which edge correspond to a change in data. Like the simulation tool is just it's just not intuitive. Like when a date like, like a single clock pulse pulses like the, it's at the end of the clock pulse that the data is actually valid and it's valid for the next clock cycle. So that took me a while to get get comfortable with. FPGAs have to use fixed routing paths for things like clock. But with an ASIC, you can route all that stuff to wherever you want to minimize delays. Right, yes. Timing constraints are tough. Hi, EEE -E -E kid from UK. What's up, Ken Chang? Okay, this is a good time to shamelessly plug myself again. What's up, guys? Um, if you've been watching this stream, uh, cool. Thanks for checking it out. This is a, an experiment here. Uh, it's my first live stream. I've screwed up a couple things because I, A, I wanted to share my screen, and here I am just talking to you. And B, um, I wanted to, well, this is a test. I want to just see how many people would join. Right now there's 30 people in the stream. That's cool. Um, but this is all made possible because of the Patreon. So check out uh, Nanland. I'm oh, sorry, patreon.com forward slash Nanland. Uh, please check it out. It's the, the Patreon I launched about nine, 10 months ago. Um, it's been very successful so far, and um, it allowed me to really explore other ways to communicate and interact with you guys. This is part of it. So um, if you're enjoying this right now, um, please consider becoming a Patreon supporter there, and I'll do more of this stuff. So that'll be fun. Thanks. What? 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 Arduino with FPGA? Hi, Craig. Um, could you please explain the difference between a wire and a reg on the input and output to a module? Um, what's up, Philip Neal? I think your name sounds familiar. Are you on Patreon? I think you are. If you are, thank you. Um, wire and a reg. Um, yeah, well, so wire and reg are like internally used inside of a module to define whether or not a signal is the output of a flip-flop. So if it's an output of a flip-flop, it'll be a reg. Um, if it's a, these are Verilog things too, by the way. Um, if it's a wire, it's just, it's just going to carry uh, information um, on, a, on a particular signal. Um, you can define now in Verilog, you can do like output reg something. And then you, the only thing that saves you is that you don't have to define the reg further down in your Verilog document, in your Verilog file. So previously in Verilog, I forget which version. In 2001, I think they added the ability, 2001. 2001, they had the ability to do output reg and then a signal name. So you didn't have to add like output signal name and then reg that same signal. Saves you a little bit of typing. That's really the only difference there. What's the toughest bug you had to figure out when implementing your code and hardware? Um, that's a good question. I, I had uh, what turned out to be a data, um, a data throughput bug that took me like weeks to find. Um, it ended up being the, there was a situation in which, uh, you have, imagine you have a FIFO and one clock domain going into the FIFO and another clock going out of the FIFO. The average clock, the average data throughput through this interface was okay, but there'd be a, every now and then the throughput would get too high on the input side and, to, and the output side wouldn't be fast enough to suck that data out. And so the FIFO would overflow which was which I didn't know was happening, and uh, so it was an overflowed FIFO caused by too much data at a particular time. Uh, that took me forever to find, and eventually I did find it, but it was brutal. So I'm like super sensitive to FIFO overflow and underflow conditions. Uh, in case you, if you've seen my FIFO videos, you have maybe picked up on that. Mm -hmm. You partially answered this already, but what do you need to consider from moving your design from FPGA to ASIC? Uh, from moving your design to FPGA to ASIC, you need to, I, so I haven't personally done this, so this is just like what I've read about, but the only reason, the reason why you'd wanna do that is because you just have super high volume and it just makes sense to do that. Um, other than that, it doesn't make sense. Try again, hi Craig, sorry, maybe I missed something. Uh, Arduino with FPGA, MKR, Vidor 4000. Also see the SNO board. I need to do, yeah, I don't, I will Google those things. 
Okay. It's an Arduino Corporation Embedded System Development Board. Oh, is this the okay. You're at your this is the answer to the question of like what uh yeah, is there an, uh, an FPGA that's like an Arduino? And uh, Craig is saying the MKR Vidor 4000, which really doesn't roll off the tongue very easily, uh, is a similar thing. It's an Intel Cyclone Cyclone 10 FPGA and Microsip, Microchip SAMD21. Guys, Vidor 4000, you need to come up with a better name than Vidor 4000, first of all. Second of all, I like the MIPI camera connector. That's neat. Micro HDMI, cool, cool, cool. Eight bit, eight megabytes of SRAM, two megabytes of uh, quad spy. Yeah, that's neat. Um, if anybody wants to see what I'm looking at, I I, I can't vouch for this. So um, I was talking about the MKR Vidor 4000. Craig was linking me to that. So that's that's cool. It looks like a neat little thing. It's still seventy bucks though, seventy three dollars plus shipping, or whatever. I don't know. I wish something were cheaper. I'm probably not going to go on too much longer, maybe another 10 or 15 minutes. Hello, Elius. I am doing well. Thank you. I'm going to stop for a little, little drink break. Ella, Ellis, El, Ulis. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm butchering your name. <clears throat> Ken Chang, do more lives. I had just started VHL and Verilog. Do more lives. Okay, sure. Support me on Patreon. And I will do more lives. This is fun. Um, is VLS, VLS, VLSI related to FPGA in any way? Uh, VLSI is designing chips. Uh, FPGA is using chips that are already designed. Um, can you go over your process for taking a video idea from a note all the way to posting the video? Um, if people are interested in that, I mean, I could like live stream, you know, I could live stream coding. I could live stream like creating tutorials if that's interesting. This is all just kind of an experiment. What are some constructive things to do while waiting for your build to finish? <laughs> Push-ups? Um, I tried searching a YouTube video on p5.js get octave bands, uh, but it gets no results. I'm sorry, Andre. It's just two different devices in one piece. Okay. What is the ideal team size when implementing an FPGA design? Keep in mind, people may get moved on and off of a project. Uh, that totally depends on the complexity of the design. So like ideally it's just one, I mean, that's great. Then you just own the whole thing. Um, but it, you know, for like a zinc or something where you have like a, a CPU and some FPGA logic, um, it, it might very well be much more than that. Is it possible to convert uh, anyway, a simple VHDL code to 100% NAND gates and visualize this. Uh, it's called gate level simulation, um, and it takes a long time to run, but yes. Audio file here, I might be lost. Hello, audio file, I'm Russell. Hi, I want your opinion on VHDL toolkit for Linux. VHDL tool chain for Linux. Um, depends on which vendor you're using. I don't know which vendor you're talking about. What could it do? I need examples of open MSP430 processor coding in Bavado. Good luck with your search, sir or madam. Electronic ash, okay. What are the most expensive pieces of equipment that I broke? <laughs> ha. What it, uh, I broke, um, I used to work with uh, infrared detectors and each infrared detector was $10,000. I blew up a lot of those. Uh, what's up, Charles Hoffman? I'm a process guy, so I'd second the call for a vid live where you describe your process of creating a video. Okay, good to know. Thanks, guys. Altoriumtech.com slash SNO. Okay, Craig's really pushing this, this thing. I got it. Okay. Okay, Craig. Dot com. I guess you can't post links in the chat, huh? That's probably to keep down on all your spam, Craig. I'm gonna check this out. Okay. Snow FPGA module. For fifty bucks. So Craig, okay, I'm gonna just post this to the chat. Craig is really imploring me to look at this. Uh, programmable with Arduino, embedded thingy do 
accelerator blocks. Cool. I have I have nothing. I have no. Uh, I've never used it. Um, it looks cool, and maybe that'll take off. Maybe that's all you need is a little snow. Snow is another word for cocaine. Interesting choice of words, guys. What should the software engineers know about what digital design engineers can and can't do? Software engineers love blaming digital engineers. Um, yeah, that, that's always like, uh, yeah, that's always fun. I, trying to explain like fixed point math to like MATLAB people is always fun. She's like, you, you listen guys, I, I, I can't do floating point math. I don't, I really can't. Just give me fixed point stuff. They don't quite get it. Gate level simulation takes a long time. It's quite an understatement. Yeah. It's more like a long time. Yeah, okay, I was being sarcastic. Gate level simulation takes a long time. Um, is, it, is it possible to use the built-in flash of FPGA to program ASIC? No. ASIC is not really something you should be reprogramming. It's a chip that works in a very specified way. What should entry-level FPGA engineers do? They should dress well. They should have a funny joke to tell. Um, oh no, what should they know? Okay, what should they know? That's a different question. Um, they should know, um, I did it, actually, I, I, you know what? Let me link to a video. Um, I, linked, I created a video of example interview questions for a job. If you ever wanted to get a job working with FPGAs, like if you knew the answers, if you could crush those answers uh, on that video, I would hire you as an entry-level FPGA in a heartbeat, absolutely. Hey, Bradley, any thought on talking about the process you went through to get your Go board manufactured? I could tell you, I contacted a company in China via Alibaba. Yeah, Alibaba, and um, sent them money via a wire transfer, which was a really uncomfortable thing to do because you're like, hope I get something back. And a few, six weeks later, a whole bunch of Go boards arrived at my house and I packaged them up and shipped them off to people who had backed the Kickstarter. And that was two and a half years ago. So. Good times. I'm still working with the same company. So it was, it was an interesting experience, um, but it worked out because I wouldn't be here if it didn't actually. Let's see. What's the best way to learn FPGA? Nanland.com, dude. Nanland.com. Verilator essentially does gate level SIM and can run entire cores. Are you familiar with Power VR? I am not familiar with Power VR, but I am going to wrap things up shortly, so I'm not going to be Googling that. Do you think universities are turning out digital design engineers as fast as the market needs them? Um, I don't have a great answer to that. I don't, uh, I don't know a lot of people who come out of college who are like FPGA digital design engineer experts, though. I think it's a super niche -y thing, right? I mean, otherwise, you know, yeah, it's just really uncommon. Um, but the market, there are a lot of needs for it. Um, so probably no is the answer. Got to go. Look forward to the next stream. Goodbye, Craig. See you later. Have a good night. Uh, what do I do for fun? I have three children. That's fun. Um, what, hobbies. I like to bike ride. Um, I like to play Overwatch. Uh, that's a video game. How do you approach challenging projects? Uh, simultaneously top down and bottom up, actually. And I should talk about that at some point. Um, so top down meaning like architecture, define the architecture, define like major pieces of functionality and then bottom up where you're actually like designing, okay, I know I need a UART, so let me just, I'll just put the UART in there and like get something put in place. So eventually those two things, top down, bottom up, meet somewhere in the middle. Um, that's how I like to do it. Did you do the board design yourself? Um, I did it in Eagle myself. Do you think computer science projects will start filling uh, VHDL programming roles, com computer science people? Y yeah. I mean, I, so by degree, I was an electrical engineer, so I didn't 
I did a, I did one Verilog design as an undergrad. That was it. Um, but I worked for a company that just, I just found myself enjoying um, the FPGA design at a defense contractor. So that's where I got started. Um, but yeah, so I think any you know, software engineers or, or um, electrical engineers or whoever is interested can absolutely fill that role. I don't think it needs to be trained. You don't need to be trained for it specifically. Is it possible to program your FPGA in such a way to destroy the board? Yes, but I can't tell you. It's very secret. No, you can't destroy the board. If you can, let me know, because that'd be cool. Um, and also a little scary. No, you can't destroy it. What's the difference between FPGA and Arduino? That's a bigger question. I do want to answer that question, though, because you're asking, like, what's the difference between FPGA logic and CPU logic, which I, I do want to talk about that. Um, and I will create a video for that. It's on the list. Boo, boo, boo. ARM as HPS with Linux in it. Okay. How important is it to have mature requirements before starting to code? I mean, I've never had mature requirements before, uh, <laughs> like ever. So not super important, but you know, you, you kind of need to be a little easygoing and take things in stride when they're like, oh yeah, that median filter that we said we needed actually turns out it's uh, something completely different. It's a convolution now. Enjoy. Hope that's not a big deal. Um, doo -doo -doo. Where was I? What specifically debug you are? What's what does specific cat say? Hi to the cat, everybody. Cat tell me again. Meow. She interrupts all my videos. Oh, don't bite. That's not nice. What does specifically debug UART interface does? Uh, it's a good way to just probe individual bytes. So if you want to, if you want to take a look at some individual bytes coming out of your FPGA, UART's a good way to do it. You ever have trouble getting yourself through a project, even if you love what you're working on? And how do you get yourself through the work? Um, I do have trouble getting myself through a project sometimes. I have trouble starting a project. That is always my biggest challenge. Um, and the the way I end up just getting started is by just getting started, which is like, don't be depressed. Be not be happy. So I don't know. I don't really have a great solution, answer for you. I mean, that's obviously hard. Um, I, do have a, I do have a hard time getting started in projects. Like just jumping in. You got to just like start jumping in and just start writing code, even though it's shit and you know you're going to rewrite it. Just jump in. Uh, what happens if you accidentally drive a signal onto an output pin or put a 3.3 volt signal onto a 2.5 volt pin? You're probably fine. Yeah, uh, yeah, you're, you're most of the time you're not going to destroy a chip that way. Hello there. We have started a final year project for our electrical engineering degree. It's an SOC system on a chip for processing and monitoring. We are super new to FPGA and SOC. Welcome to FPGA and SOC. I hope you have a good time. Good luck with your project. Hellfire. Best resources to learn system Verilog for verification? Uh, I don't know. Uh, that's a good question. I, eventually, I want to create stuff for system Verilog. So maybe me someday in the future? Oh, hopefully. Do you use stuff from CS classes like Boolean algebra and Carnot maps? Oh, Carnot maps. How I hate you. Um, I just did a video on how much I hate Carnot maps. So I definitely don't use anything about Carnot maps because they're terrible. Um, <laughs> it's funny you ask that question. Carnot maps are useless. Anyway, do you have any tutorial videos which are in sequence to learn from? Uh, the Go board tutorials, actually. OK, you know what? Shameless plug. Guys, if you want to learn and you want to uh, follow some tutorials like with my face talking talking at you, check out the Go board. Um, the Go board was really what I created that spawned nanland.com. Um, it's a little FPGA board. It's $65, and um, it's got 10 tutorials associated with it, pushing buttons, flashing LEDs, using a VGA connector, getting a UART up and running. Uh, so it's really meant as an introduction for beginners. And it's, it's why I'm able to have this live stream, uh, partially the Go board and Patreon really keep me going. So. Um, if you want to get some hands-on experience, definitely get yourself a Go board and check it out because it's it's a great way to learn. It's it's the reason I created it for beginners. You know, there's too many boards out there that just have no tutorials associated with them. They're like, here's some hardware. Good effing luck getting started. 
Um, and the Go board is different because I created videos associated with it. I give you a bunch of code and I walk you through exactly how it all works. Um, so check out the Go board, buy it. The, the, the boards, the boards which you pay for, you get the content for free. So enjoy. Um, ha, glad to know someone where you are has the same thing. Thanks. You're welcome. Is it good to give the clock to the ASIC generated from FPGA? It's great. I don't, I don't know what that means, actually. So I, I shouldn't be sarcastic in my answers. Um, is it good to give the clock to the ASIC generated from FPGA? Uh, oh, OK, you're asking if an FPGA should drive anything. Probably not, actually. Uh, FPGA clocks probably have are subject to jitter. So like it's not super precise with, um, with its timing, really. Um, and so if you have, if you have like an ASIC that needs to be driven with a very precise crystal oscillator, you should probably get a dedicated one, but maybe yours is fine. I don't know what your applications are. Why were you at a teaching where am I? Was I, were you a teaching assistant? Yes. Uh, in another question asked about the future of PGAs, I was thinking about embedding an FPGA inside of an ASIC. Use some inputs to reconfigure the FPGA to allow ASIC to be more versatile. Ah, yeah, that'd be cool. Dan Blankenship, I'm down with that. Question, do you think that interfacing a 3.3 volt FPGA with a TTL 5 volt using a resistor to lower the voltage is sufficient? Ooh, no, probably not. I mean, it might work, but check out buffers. Um, who makes buffers? A lot of companies, TI makes buffers. Check out TI, go to like, go to interfaces and check out some voltage buffers because that's the right way to do it. <clears throat> Thoughts on Innovate FPGA? I am unfamiliar with it, Gallo Sanchez, but I'm sure it's interesting. Do you see digital design engineers working the embedded C portions of a project at all? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, that's why that, C is super useful for like testing your FPGA. Like if you have a if you have a microcontroller and you want to know if your FPGA is is working correctly, you know there's nothing better than just a microcontroller to like beat up on it and make sure that it's responding correctly. And if you can test your own FPGA code rather than trusting some some lowly software engineer to do it, um, that's the best way to do it. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Like learn C, learn embedded stuff, and um, test your own stuff. You, know, you can hand it off to the software engineer. And if he's like, hey, I found a bug, he's like, oh, no, you didn't, because my, my code's perfect. Uh, you messed up. And then you can feel great about yourself. So check that out. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time. Hey, Hellfire, I appreciate you, man. Thanks a lot. Or woman. Sir, is ARM IP available in open source domain? I don't, I don't think so. Isn't ARM, like their whole shtick is to just license, right? I don't know. FPGA is an ASIC, and that ASIC is called FPGA. All right. Hi, Nanland. Have an EE degree. Currently have a gap for unemployment. How sustainable is the FPGA careers? I heard people say how our positions are being outsourced. Um, I don't know what country you're in, Byron 8899. Um, however, if you're good at a niche thing and FPGA is the nichiest of things, then you will have a career pretty much forever. For you, Lattice or Altera? Uh, I don't feel strongly about either. So. Altera is a little better on the, the, the software support side of things, uh, but I like Lattice products a lot too. I mean, I made the Go board, which uses a nice 40 FPGA. Check out the Go board again, guys. Okay. Is teaching things like open drain and high impedance, high Z used in design, something I, uh, that is outside of the scope of what you are trying to focus on? No, I no, I, I don't think so. No, that's that's definitely within scope. I'm taking a C++ course. Will that help me at all for FPGA? Yeah, I, I mentioned this a little bit, but like, yes, absolutely. Um, programming is programming is all very similar, and C can help you test your FPGA code. So yes. Um, all right, guys. I I think I need to wrap this up. Um, this has been a lot of fun, and uh, I've I've actually really enjoyed this. So that's great. And there's still 40 people here listening to me talk. So guys, awesome. One more shameless plug. Check out my Patreon, uh, patreon.com forward slash Nanland. A uh, couple things. This will happen more often if you guys support me there. I'm happy to answer questions like this. 
um, you know, maybe we'll see how the support goes and, and if, it, if it's worthwhile. Um, for now, I'll, I'll try to do this again uh, and keep it, you know, free for anybody who's a subscriber to my YouTube. Um, at some point, it might become exclusive. I'm not sure. Um, but the best way to make sure that this just is an option is just to support me on Patreon uh, uh, and, and keep me keep me creating other good content. If you want to work with FPGAs, if you find some of this content really interesting, check out nanland.com forward slash go board. Hey, here comes a link. Boom. Um, and get yourself a go board. It, the reason why I created it was to make you know, teaching FPGA is interesting and useful for beginners. Um, a lot of tutorials there that kind of take you, hold your hand from like, how, you know, how do I program, like make an LED turn on to like, how do I create Pong on a VGA display, which is an actual tutorial on the board that you can learn. So um, if you're looking for some hands-on, uh, hands-on use, you know, check out, check out the go board there. And uh, again, thanks very much for, for watching tonight. I, uh, I really do appreciate it. This has been a lot of fun for me, so I will definitely do this again. And uh, have, have a good night, y'all.